Hey, Charles, how are you doing? I'm okay. How are you? Good, thank you. Well, uh, it is a long way to full utilization of uh, the private ACA exchanges. Uh, mm -hmm. they had, we had a good, good year last year, uh, surpassed expectations, but there's a very long way to go. Uh, the, the CBO has long since forecast that by 2018, there'd be, uh, I think, 25 million people using the exchanges. Mm -hmm. uh, and famously, uh, for this coming year, they've uh, stuck to a projection of 13 million signed up by the end of the year. Uh, HHS, uh, as you well know, dialed that back uh, quite recently uh, in the last few days to somewhere mm -hmm. between nine and 10 million. And uh, you tell me that you, uh, you've you crunched some numbers as, as is your won't and put your own projection together. Uh, so why don't we, yeah. So uh, why don't we start with that? Um, where you see okay. it coming out and uh, what sources you used? Okay, sure. Um, so, well, the first thing that I should say, and um, I just mentioned this to you uh, just before we um, went, to, went live, uh, is that there was actually a light breaking, well, it's not really light, light breaking news. Um, it's just something that I didn't notice a couple of days ago when HHS came out with, they issued a press release a few days ago in which they said uh, two main things. They said, first of all, that uh, as of mid-October, there were about 7.1 million people still enrolled through private uh, policies through the uh, healthcare exchanges. And right. that they, but the bigger point they were making was that their projection, their official HHS projection for 2015 open enrollment was um, between 9 and 9.9 .9 million. Right. Um, and that was the, you know, kind of the big story was, oh, they, HHS's number is dropped down considerably uh, from uh, the CBOs. Right. However... Um, I was just reading earlier today, or yesterday by the time this is uh, broadcast, a political article which explored that further, and there were some interviews with some, some other folks, and it turns out that the 9 to 9.9 .9 million figure range was actually the projected number at the end of 2015. Mm -hmm. So the actual number, the total number through the end of the open enrollment period on February 15th, 2015, is actually between 10.3 and 11.2 million, according to HHS. Uh -huh. right. And uh, if you um, divide that out, what that basically means is they're saying that around 10.3 to 11.2 million they expect to enroll by the end of the enrollment period, and then about 12% of those folks will have dropped off by the end of the year, for failure to pay their uh, policies, uh, their, their uh, premiums, <coughs> and um, mm -hmm. yeah, and also for the normal churn of people being added and dropping off, and so on. Right. So, right. so their actual total number is is actually about twelve percent higher than that nine to nine point nine million. But they are wisely, in my opinion, knocking off another twelve percent in their official end of year uh, projection this time around. So, so that 11 that. to 12 million is to 9 to uh, 10 million as like the uh, the original 8.3, I think was the peak million sign up is to the current um, 7.7. 7. Yeah. Right. And you've right. learned quite a bit um, in your tracking about uh, normal attrition, right? So that's, that's no surprise. Yeah. And actually, um, what I found over the summer and the fall is that there's been as people being added and people dropping off through special um, qualifying life events, um, the end number in October of 7.1 million is actually almost exactly what it was in late April, early May, uh, around also around 7.1 million when you take into account people who you know don't pay their uh, their first um, first first month's premium. So it basically it went from about 7.1 million paid up to about 7.3 million in August, and then back down again a bit, uh, down to 7.1. So we're kind of ending right where we started after you knock off the uh, people who don't pay. Uh-huh, 
Uh, so the so the people who who never paid are essentially the whole difference. The ones who the the ones who come on an, uh, anew during special enrollment mm-hmm. uh, because of their own circumstances, and the ones who drop off because they've gotten a job or uh, or they've gotten married or or whatever, mm-hmm. uh, they basically have canceled each other out for the first open enrollment. Yes and no. Um, what I found was that the reason the number was going up and a bit until around August was because the number of people being added seemed to be outpacing the number dropping off a bit. So, mm-hmm. you know, maybe, maybe 10,000 were being added and 8,000 were dropping. And, you know, and so you were adding maybe a thousand a day or something like that. What happened after August was a couple of things. First, you had people who fell into the uh, three month grace period uh, rule, which says that the, under the ACA, you, um, the insurance companies can't drop you unless you haven't paid your premiums for at least 90 days. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they, a lot of people, presumably some people paid for May, for, for April or May, and then it was August or September before, you know, then they didn't pay for their second uh, or third month's premium. And then finally they were able to be dropped off. The other big difference is that um, there were about 100,000 people or so who were dropped uh, apparently because of immigration issues, uh, right, right, uh, right. legal citizenship issues, that sort of thing, uh, discrepancies in their data. And so they were given until the end of September to rectify that. And if they didn't, they were dropped. So there, there were several things that happened as sort of one-time uh, drops you know, towards the fall. But that seems to have pretty much sort of brought it right back to where it was in the first place. Around seven right. So may, I guess we'll we'll find out if uh, if the ACA, if the ACA survives the uh, the Supreme Court challenge. We'll find out year by year whether there's a kind of, you know, whether it continues to follow that pattern mm-hmm. with a little surge after an open enrollment and then some drop off before, uh, before the next open enrollment. Right. I mean, you know, those data issues like the immigration issues. I'm assuming that the payment rates will probably go up a little bit. Um, as more and more exchanges get better about requiring, either allowing or requiring payment of the first premium as part of the enrollment process. You know, last year there were only two states that had that, Massachusetts and Washington State, and Massachusetts doesn't really count because their exchange was so screwed up. Um, this year I know California, Covered California, is allowing payment as an option. It's not being required, but it is being you know, an optional uh, thing. So, you know, maybe a third of the people or something who enroll this year might pay up and that hopefully will boost their payment rates and so on. So I'm guessing that eventually um, for technical reasons and uh, logistical reasons, you know, might nudge up a bit to say 90% from 88% paying or something like that. And then also Mm -hmm. on the immigration and data side, those are discrepancies. Presumably the government is getting better about streamlining and updating their files and databases and so on. So there should be, you know, fewer discrepancies. Maybe this year was a hundred thousand people. Maybe next year will be, you know, fifty thousand or something. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, we can hope that things get smoother as time goes on. Mm-hmm. So uh, let's uh, let's raise the curtain and, and move on to uh, to your uh, your right. projections and why they're a bit different from both CBO and uh, okay and um, oh, I'm sorry. and HHS. HHS. Sorry. Right. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, what I did basically was a couple things. First of all, I looked at, um, you've got the CBO saying around 13 million, you've got HHS saying around 9 to 10, paying out of 10 to 11 total. And then I looked mm-hmm. at some other sources, and you've got about a half dozen states have issued their own um, state level projections or targets. Um, some of them are from the state exchanges like um, Covered California, um, Colorado, uh, Connecticut. I think those are those are the three I can think of. And then there's also some cases where you have, um, like in Florida, the, the state insurance commissioner, the, the insurance department, they issued last summer, back in June, when the uh, filings from the insurance companies came out, they issued a projection of how many people they anticipate uh, enrolling for year two. And it was, it was um, up to slightly over 1 million in Florida and, and so mm-hmm. on. And so, um, and there are a few other sources. And when you add them all up, basically they range anywhere from around 30% to 
in a 30% increase up to around, uh, I think like a 60% increase depending on the source. Um, and then the high end of course was uh, the CBO, which was saying 13 million versus you know 7.1, which is like an 80% increase. So there's a range there. And then the other thing I looked at was the, there was an article that interviewed a bunch of insurance executives and, and uh, spokespeople uh, from different companies and their numbers, they were saying, well, we think it'll be 20% higher or it might even be a doubling, you know, 100%. Um, the only problem with that is that in a lot of cases, they may be talking about market share, you know, not an overall increase, but you know, if you have 100,000 people in a state and they have 20,000 and they go to 40,000, maybe that other 20,000 is coming from someone else. So I'm not sure if that's really, you know, worth looking at. But um, yeah, so I sort of took all these, mushed them together, and then I looked at some other factors um, that don't have any hard numbers attached to them, uh, which are things like, you know, how many people are still out there as an available pool, um, how much better or streamlined are the, the uh, websites, the exchanges, you know, this year over last year. There were a lot of serious technical issues. Right. Most of those have hopefully been worked out, and I know we want to talk about that a little later. Um, so that, that should be a much smoother process. Um, also, what's the outreach factor? Um, the exchanges and the organizations devoted to enrolling people are going to have to change their techniques this year around because last year, most of the seven to eight million people, depending on how you count it, who enrolled um, were people who really, you know, they, they were sick, that they couldn't get insurance because they had a pre-existing condition. And so they've been trying for years or, or they just, they couldn't afford it because, and so the tax credits, you know, were a big incentive. Um, this year, the conventional wisdom is that most of those folks have already, you know, already on board. And the question is how many of the others who didn't enroll, you know, why didn't they, and how are you going to find them and how are you going to explain, you know, about tax credits and, and so on. And then there's also the individual mandate, you know, what's the penalty or the tax, uh, that they'll have to pay if they don't enroll and that sort of thing. So they're going to have to change their techniques. And, that, and that's right ratcheting up considerably this year well right it's, uh, it's going up but it's all it's it's they got the low-hanging fruit last year right. and so they have to change techniques to get the, the next batch yeah right. just uh one one clarification on that so mm -hmm. certainly they got the low-hanging fruit in, in terms of people who felt the most acute need but most of the target people are going to remain uh eligible for subsidies isn't that mm -hmm. right i mean they're still still projecting a large pool uh, i think your your project uh, you, you cited hhs sees about 15 million uninsured subsidy eligible people uh, who earn too much to qualify for medicaid but could be in the exchanges and cbo i think is at about 18 million in their estimate yeah, yeah there's, there's a range there and i know uh, larry levitt at kaiser has always has said that it's always been hard to to actually get a grip on what the actual size of the uh, of the market of people who are looking for insurance uh, on their own is, uh, it's, yeah, it's because, always been a range of estimates. Yeah, and, and also, you know, uh, Kaiser Family Foundation, uh, which Larry Lovett works for, um, they issued a, I think it was them who issued a, a survey a couple weeks back that said that something like ninety percent of those fifteen to eighteen million people apparently don't even know. That the open enrollment rate right. or didn't at the time, and you know, and like over half have no idea about tax credits, and you know, basically, so the remaining folks are going to be very, very difficult to find and educate and inform and you know, explain the whole situation to. Um, mm -hmm. So having you know, so there's that factor. Um, you, you throw that all together, blend it all together, and um, my official projection, which was, which will have been posted as of this morning by the time that people are watching this, uh, comes in, <laughs> comes in at a total enrollment that is whether paid or not total of around 12 million and a paid enrollment of around 10 and a half million. That's what I'm thinking. So, so basically I'm kind of splitting the elevated for, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the, uh, the, the total paid, given the clarification that you uh, mm -hmm. that you started with, the total paid enrollment is kind of modestly above uh, what 
what um, HHS was forecasting for the end of open enrollment, right? Right. It's well, a, they well they're saying that HHS is saying that their paid range should be between nine to nine point nine, and so yeah, I'm mm-hmm. saying I, I think it'll be a bit higher, maybe around ten point five. Um, mm-hmm. And then the same for you know the total. There, there's I didn't know what their total. I didn't know about that they were looking at. I thought that nine to nine point nine was their total, and then of that they were expecting only you know around eight million, eight to nine million paying. Um, yeah. So it wasn't until today, today after I'd made my projection, I, I thought that I was um, coming out with a hot, with a somewhat higher higher number that they did. It turned out it's only a slightly higher number when you mm-hmm. you know explain that to people and when you take that right. into account. So, right. and I know it's not, you know, it's not a particularly exciting uh, thing. I, I don't know if people were expecting me to say it was only going to be 5 million or it was going to be 50 million, you know, but, right. you know, I'm, I'm, as I said in my, uh, my blog post about it, uh, which again, people will be seeing by the, uh, by the time this is airing, um, I'm optimistic, but I'm also a realist. There's a lot of unknowns here. All right. Um, one way to uh, just kind of to, to back up for what, where you might differ, my sense is that if you averaged out the, uh, the state projections that you mentioned, they, they're significantly higher than, um, than HHS's. Is. Um, is that, do you think, is it fair to say that that accounts for, for you, you know, elevating the HHS um, total a bit, or is that the main? Is, some of it is that, and some of it is just me um, Sorry. thinking that HHS might be lowballing a little bit just to play it cautiously, um, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, again, some of it is this, I'm just I'm an optimist, and I know, for example, well, there, there's also one other factor, um, is sort of sort of an ace in the hole of sorts. Um, Massachusetts. Massachusetts, if their exchange, which of course was the original exchange, if their exchange was uh, had been working properly last year, then they would have had something like on the order of 300,000 people enrolled in the state. Um, that's how many people well, tried. Well, warehoused in like temporary Medicaid or something. Yeah, they put them into some sort of, I, I, I never, I was never able to understand exactly what, it, it sounds like it was, it might have been like an extension of Commonwealth care or some quasi Medicaid. I'm not sure what it was. It was some sort of state program that they made some sort of scramble to make some sort of arrangements for. And they basically mm-hmm. shunted about 300,000 people over there. Uh, and that's where they've been covered for like the last, you know, up to a year and nine or 10 months now. Um, and all, they have some special part. They have this completely overhauled, you know, exchange system. And I know that they're doing like a three phase kind of a thing. Uh, for when people will be, you know, in that category will be enrolled. If it works properly this time around, and if everybody participates and so on, then in theory, they could go from something like 34,000, I think there are something like 34,000 people who are actually enrolled in policies, to um, something like 300, you know, 300, well, yeah, an additional 300,000 or so. So they, they could, in theory, they could like go up 12 fold or 11 fold or something in one shot. You know, so that's like an extra 300,000 people or 250,000 people more than, you know, that, that are sort of aside from any other state. So, you know, so that, um, that could make a difference. I don't know, but we'll see. And there's some other there's some other things as well. But a lot, a lot of this is just sort of a gut feeling. And, you know, again, it's important for people to remember, if it ends up being higher, I'll be thrilled. I will be absolutely thrilled to be wrong if I'm wrong on the low side. You know, if I'm low balling, right. then that'd be great. Um, if it ends up being, it turns out that HHS has it on the nose, then, uh, you know, some people will be, uh, I'm sure the pundits and the press will be, you know, ah, see, they, they said 13 million, they only came up with less than 10, and, you know, disaster. Well, you know, it, it's that's still, you know, 9 or 10 million people or whatever who have, you know, healthcare coverage. So it's, um, even as the guy who is like the number cruncher, you know, guy, uh, the numbers, yes, they're important, but they're not quite as important. As, you know, there are a lot of other factors involved as well. So, right, and uh, sort of real, real world or long term criteria um, are more whether the uh, whether the the markets in each state are healthy, whether the the risk pool in in each state um, mm-hmm. 
makes the insurance companies feel confident uh, that uh, they can operate profitably there, right. uh, et cetera. Yeah, it's, it's, there's really, I mean, there's there's the actuary side, you know, is there an, is the risk pool, are the people who are enrolling, uh, as, as Ezra Klein you know, famously said way back over a year, almost a year ago, it's better to have, from an actuary point of view, it's, it would be better to only have three or four million people if they're all, you know, young and healthy or, you know, if they're low cost to the insurers, right. then it would be to have, you know, 20 million people, but they're, they're all, you know, very expensive to treat. So uh, there's that. The other factor is, uh, you know, is the exchanges, is there has to be enough people on each of the exchanges to, um, for the fees or whatever, to pay for it, to make it self-sustaining or almost self, you know, break even or whatever. And then the third factor because is Because the insurance the companies factor. pay, yeah. Right, right. And then the rest of it is all the PR stuff, you know, is, is well, does it look, you know, does it look good? Does it look bad? I mean, again, you know, the, the, in, the employer mandate, you know, says that, well, you know, if you, well, what if, what if unemployment drops by two points, you know, and so now you have millions more people being hired with, you know, good, solid, high paying, fully covered, you know, with fully covered employer sponsored insurance. Well, yeah, if several million people drop off the exchange because they're hired to a job that has coverage, that's not a bad thing. You know, that's okay. So, And in fact, again, the uninsurance rate could go down. Um, the uninsurance sorry. rate could go... Sorry about that. The uninsurance rate could go down uh, even if the... Uh, or e even as the uh, exchange sign-up tally... Uh, "Quote unquote disappoints," I suppose, if, if, in the scenario mm -hmm. you were outlining. If the you know the better the economy is, the less yeah. demand there might be in the in the individual market. And really, the uh, the insurance rate going down is is the bottom line. I, I think it was a Rand study that um, that forecast uh, a quite substantial drop in the uninsured in the uninsured rate, uh, which I think has been borne out. Uh, but they also forecast it going forward, but they forecast um, a lot more people gaining employment, uh, gaining insurance through employment than uh, than others did. So, um, right, and so that was that was actually, if you read the press release by HHS where they gave their ninety nine point nine million, uh, they actually talked about that. They actually said the reason for the discrepancy between the thirteen million and the nine, you know, the nine to ten million. Uh, the main reason they cited was that. Right. They felt that when the CBO said 13 million, they thought that, that CBO was overestimating how many employers would be dropping coverage for their employees. And they mm -hmm. think that it, it turns out that it's not as many as they thought. And so, you know, so that means fewer people who would be kicked, you know, or moved or gently nudged, you know, whatever, over to the exchanges. So, again, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it's all, again, it's all, some of that is perception, you know. So. Right. Um, well, you mentioned uh, a couple of minutes ago, you mentioned your gut, uh, mm -hmm. and the, the gut is often sort of uh, contrasted with uh, with number crunching these days, mm -hmm. you know, sort of the Nate Silvers versus the old, uh, the old political operatives has become almost a kind of journalistic cliche, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, but you are the number cruncher and you, you acknowledge um, a role for, I mean, obviously there's a lot of uncertainty here. So, uh, so there's some intuition, but I wonder uh, your intuition such as it is, is derived now from about a year of intense tracking of the numbers as they come in. Uh, so maybe we could uh, sort of back up and, uh, Talk a little bit about what you learned uh, while tracking signups through the very first open season and the uh, and the off season. After that, uh, there were times when you had you had the data uh, that to help uh, push back against some media narratives. Uh, you know, predicting various catastrophes or uh, you know questioning results that were starting to look good. Uh, so, would would you want to talk a bit about? Um, sort of finger to the pulse um, what you learned by tracking the market. Sure. Uh, you know, I mean, I'll say that a lot of people were wrong about a lot of things. Um, I, you know, I wasn't always right about everything that I, uh, that I said. I, I did make a few mistakes. Not, none of them tended to be really big splashy ones, but, um, you know, but I was wrong about some things. 
And, you know, and that's okay. I mean, the, the data is, you know, it's, it's a question of how reliable the source is. I remember there was early on, there was a lot of confusion, like last uh, November. And I'm talking about after the numbers actually started be- becoming you know, usable uh, mm-hmm. in mid to late November. There was a lot, a lot of questions about whether the numbers that were being released were uh, households versus individuals. You know, they would say, "Well, you know, there's this many policies. Well, is that a policy, or, is, or does that mean, you know, an average of, you know, you know, two point one kids or whatever it is? You know, you're talking about two or three people in a house." And and there were a couple of articles that you know people would send me an article in you know the local paper, and it would say, "Well, you know, this state, Colorado, or whatever it was." Uh, you know, they said that, well, had, you know, X thousand of, of, um, of enrollees. And then it turned out, oh, that was, and it would, in some cases, it even said, you know, it would even have have a clarification saying this is households, not people. And then it turns out it was people, you know, so there was a lot of that early on. You know, there was a lot of confusion, especially in the very early days in October when there were all the technical problems. Uh, people were being confused between how many people visited the websites versus how many uh, created an application, how many applied, that is, you know, set up a, a user right. account, right. and how many actually enrolled, and then, you know, and then, of course, later it became, well, how many of those people paid, and you know, so there's several different numbers you're looking at, uh, so there was a lot of confusion, and there was a lot of nonsense, and, um, you know, that's why I started doing what, I'm, what I've been doing, was to try and just, you know, sort through that and get at the hard numbers, I mean, because I am, in general, supportive of the law, in general, <laughs> grudging I guess you'd say, but even as a supporter, I'd still like to know whether, you know, is it working? Are people signing up for this thing? You know, we've gone through all, yeah. all this fuss to get them into place and, and, and all that. It'd be nice if it actually was working. And, um, you know, so what I would say is, um, you know, one of the other factors that came into play was the whole canceled policy thing, you know, where President Obama got into a lot of, hot water because, you know, he had said, if you like it, you can keep it. And then they end up issuing all these cancellation notices. Well, that's a really good example. There were reports in February and March uh, where there were stories, you know, running, you know, like Breitbart and uh, and, uh, Fox and, and, you know, Town Hall and so on, Daily Caller, but also in some mainstream papers that were saying, you know, that five or six million people's policies were canceled. Well, and it turned out that actually there were five or six million who might have been at the time, potentially could have been, but in the end, it looks like it was only around between one to two million at most, partially because the, those numbers were estimates and partially because a lot of those people um, were issued a waiver where they could extend their policy by another year or two, or even in some cases three. And this year, you know, you're getting the same thing now. Oh, you know, millions of people. Well, it, but the thing is that a lot of people, there's a lot of churn. There's a lot of people who drop their policies anyway. And if they switch their policies, then their new one would have, you know, would have to be uh, one that's ACA compliant. So um, right. I got into a big tussle, online tussle, with uh, Avik Roy of you know Forbes fame o- early on over the off uh, off exchange enrollments. Um, and for a long time, for months, I was the only one who seemed to be pointing out that you know there's an awful lot of people who are still enrolling directly through Blue Cross or Aetna or you know United Healthcare or whatever, Humana or whatever. Right. directly, just like they always did before, who, you know, who aren't being counted at all, even though the pol- the new policies that, they, that they're enrolling in are still, you know, qualified health plans, that is, QHPs, as I, as I you know, refer right. to on the website a lot. And, and if I didn't, I, didn't you, uh, sorry, but with, with uh, Ovik, uh, if I remember right, part of the battle was that some of the early surveys that came out, I think McKinsey and, and mm-hmm. others, would say a quarter of of ten percent, a quarter of people who are signing up are, um, pre, you know, were were uninsured. The rest were right. already insured, and mm-hmm. and they were just rolling in um, the folks who were enrolling off exchange as well. It, exactly, yeah, and that that was the basis of that of that uh, that issue was that it's not that the it's you know there was a McKinsey study and it said it was like twenty one percent or twenty seven percent or something like that, and it's not that it, that it was inaccurate. It was that they were mixing, to, they didn't distinguish people who were on exchange versus off. And at the same time, you didn't, at the time, no one knew how many were off exchange. It could have been five people. It could have been five million. It could be 20 million. You know, I didn't, no one knew versus right. the, 
however many million it was who were on the exchange. And if you don't know, if, if only, you know, if it was 50-50, you know, say 5 million on, 5 million off, well then maybe it's zero of the people through the exchange were, you know, uninsured right. and, and, you know, 58% or some of the off. You know, there was no distinguishing between the numbers. So it became kind of meaningless for making that sort of a, a claim. In the end, now what I do know is that that number did rise gradually. That the number, the percentage of people who were previously uninsured did rise more and more and more towards the end. And by the end, uh, the KFF, Kaiser Family Foundation, did issue their own survey. And what they found, I think, was 57% nationally were previously right. uninsured. Right. So, and there was a huge surge in March that was probably much uh, a higher percentage of uninsured then than, than there right. had been uh, when you know, the really low-hanging fruit struggled through everything you had to struggle through in the fall to, or mm -hmm. even the late winter to enroll. Yeah. Well, and then also some of them were people like my wife and I, you know, we, we were, we, we got one of those scary cancellation letters, you know, that's, oh, from Blue Cross, that's a dun, 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 you know, your, you know, your policy is not complying. Well, I knew it was going to be canceled because I knew, for example, that mental health services have to be covered and ours didn't. So I knew that mm -hmm. they were probably going to cancel that one and replay have us replace it with a new one that did have that. And sure enough, that's what we did. And um, But at the same time, if we if our income had been such that we knew that we weren't going to qualify for any tax credits, at the time, why would we go through the fuss? You know, the, you know, the website was mostly working, but it still had some issues. There, was, there would have been no point for us to do that. We would have just gone directly to Blue right. Cross and said, okay, switch out plan A for plan B, you know, boom, you know, and, and that right. would be that. And we never would have right. been counted, so... Yeah. And I, in fact, um, in the spring, I spoke to a bunch of people in that situation um, mm -hmm. who uh, did not, you know, who earned too much to qualify for subsidies. And they did, they, they said exactly that there was no reason to, to, there's no incentive to go on the exchange, especially with the, with the technology so bulky mm -hmm. then uh, you could sign up in five minutes with your insurer. It's right. true that if you were unsubsidized and if you had been healthy, then your rates uh, were likely to go up because of the coverage of, of the kinds of things you mentioned. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I, I think uh, the Urban League uh, estimated that half of the people who were all already uh, getting insurance in the individual market uh, would qualify for subsidies. And it may have, in fact, turned out to be more than that. Right. And, um, and, and again, um, as I said, because of the churn rate, uh, there was another study, I don't remember if it was KFF or, or some other organization, but they came out with another study that said that even before <coughs> the ACA, there, yeah, that most people on the individual market didn't keep the same plan for, I think it was more than two years anyway, for one reason, you know, you, what if you get a job, what if you change, you know, what if it has coverage or what if you, you know, move to a different state or, you know, there's all sorts of life changes and so on. And so, you know, in the end, two or three years later, the odds are that, that something like two thirds or three fourths of the people aren't even going to have, wouldn't have had the same policy anyway. And that's, that's right. why, that's why, I mean, yeah, the, the whole cancellation for non-compliance, you know, I've said, and I've said this as a supporter of the law and as a general supporter of Obama, I've said that him saying, if you like your plan, you can keep it. I've said repeatedly, it was a dumb thing to say. Not because I felt that he was necessarily, you know, lying, but because how can you make that promise? No matter how the law had been written, what if your company right. goes out of business? What if they get There's bought been out? so much, so much churn for so long in the, in yeah. the U.S. insurance yeah. market for basically I mean, you can't, you, for everybody. You can't legally, yeah. you can't legally require, uh, you know, Blue Cross or whatever in, in a state to sell the exact same policy forever ad infinitum till the end of time because what if they merge with another company or what if they, you know, who knows? There's all sorts of things that can happen. It's like asking right. Apple to keep selling the exact same model of iPhone forever, legally. If you like your right. iPhone, you, if you like your <laughs> iPhone, you can keep it. <laughs> exactly. You know, you so mentioned it was a the, silly uh, thing like, to say. It was, for sure. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the, there, there was a Kaiser study which, which uh, found that, that people generally stay in the market for quite a short period of time. There are a bunch of studies to that effect. And in fact, it sounds like the, uh, to me, based on some of what I read, it sounds like the attrition rate um, and the projected turnover is relatively low. Um, one scholar who I think you may have interacted with too on Twitter, John Graves, um, mm. 
forecast that I think less than half of the people who will be in the market at the end of the second year uh, will have been there at the uh, at the beginning of the first year. So, uh, in fact, since people are coming in who are uninsured, there may be relatively more stability than there used to be in the individual market. But for people to move in and out of it is natural and good. It's one of its right. vital fi- functions is to be uh, is to be a stopgap for people. Yeah, um, and that's and that's also why um, even if the attrition, you know, even if the attrition rate, the net attrition rate, had been higher than it was. Um, I mean, I'm glad, you know, I'm glad it wasn't. It's nice, it's nice that it was, that it was, I had, I had actually overestimated what the drop-off would be. And, you know, that's actually, you know, I'm glad from a PR point of view, but it mm-hmm. wouldn't have been a horrible thing. And again, because to me, if somebody has coverage for, fine, so they signed up for one month and they, and, and they stayed for, you know, maybe two or three months and then they moved on to something else, that's fine. Maybe they were, you know, again, if they were 64 and they turned 65, well, now they're in Medicare. If they fell on hard times and so now, now they qualify for Medicaid, hopefully, and you know, in the states that expanded it, I mean, it's not a good thing, but at least they're still covered, you know. Or if they, and, and know, often it is a good thing. I, 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 one of my sons uh, was on had been on Cobra for a while because he'd gone mm-hmm. to freelance work. He was expecting to go to college, um, and he, uh, I, I mean, he was expecting to go into a graduate program, which he did in September. So when he knew that was going to happen, um, he transitioned out of Cobra, Cobra, he got a bronze plan uh, and saved a cup two, three hundred dollars a month. Uh, he was kind of rolling the dice because it was high deductible, but he knew he'd only be in for six months. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then he'd be on a uh, on a university plan, which is, in fact, what happened. Uh, I know somebody else who uh, had just gone through a, a divorce. She was on a plan for uh, three or four months, and then she uh, she got what was for her a dream job, and within a month, she, uh, which is unusual, I think, for employers, but within a month, they had her on their plan, so she was on for four or five months altogether, mm-hmm. and all of that is the law working um, as it should be, as far as I'm concerned, right. and uh, often the fact that people are dropping out is used as a kind of a football, and I, I think, you know, I, I've learned from reading you about the attrition rate that, um, mm-hmm. You know that it's it's not not huge and it's not something uh, it's not a negative really. And and I, I like to, there's something else that just, just I just thought of that connected to that. There's sort of a similar situation um, in in terms of forgetting what the point of the law is. You know, which is a lot of people are sort of completely missing in the forest for the trees or whatever. You remember back in um, back so in the original deadline for open enrollment was March 31st, right? And it was a deadline. It was a deadline, right. March 31st. And then, of course, well, they had all these technical problems you know, early on, so you lost a month and a half, and then there was this huge surge at the end. And so HHS announces, well, what we're going to do is we're going to bump it out to April 15th, an extra two weeks, an extra 15 days. Uh, that, And the rule was, you know, if you at least started the process before the 31st, then, you know, right. then, then you, could, you could finish it. And, of course, starting it could mean, like, anything. I don't know. Maybe I don't know what the you know requirement was. Maybe you just you, you had visited the website once. I don't know. They were pretty loose know. about it. Yeah, they were pretty loose about it. And John Boehner, you know, you know, Speaker of the House John Boehner, he I, I saw a clip of him because because actually I was on the Al Jazeera TV at one uh, and, and they played this clip just before they had me on, so it was kind of funny. He was outraged, outraged. You know, he was so angry. He was, you know. Orange in the face. <laughs> They're breaking you know, the rules very, more exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was very upset. He's like, he's like, what the hell is this? A joke? You know, he actually said that. You know, what the hell is this? A joke? Because you know, a deadline's a deadline. And if it's not a deadline, then then what good is it? What you know, if you're not gonna stick to a deadline, you're not gonna follow the you know. Well, okay, here's the thing. Um, first of all, I guess, you know, apparently HHS does I guess they do have the right to to, you know, to issue that sort of start and end date. That's their call, I guess. But what he forgot, or he didn't forget, but what a lot of people forget is, what is the reason for having a cutoff date? What is the reason for having an open enrollment period? Well, the only there's two main reasons that I know of. One is that uh, the smaller reason is that the actuaries for the insurance companies need to be able to have time to, you know, recrunch their numbers and set the prices, you know, for the following year, right? right. If you do that, if you had it open year round, then there'd never be sort of an off time for them to, to do their work and... and figure out where, you know, where they need to go. But the larger, the, the main reason, and this is the reason why most large corporations that offer insurance have open enrollment period where there's a cutoff, and it's usually much shorter, as I understand. 
uh, you know, like two months or three months or something. Why do they do that? Because if you're going to have a rule that says that they have to accept everyone, regardless of medical condition, pre-existing conditions, and so on, then that means that if you let anyone enroll at any time under any conditions, that means that people can play Russian roulette and they can, you know, they can game the system by going without insurance for months or years at a time. And then after they get, you know, oh, now I'm diagnosed with cancer. Now I'm going to roll, you know, now right. I'm going to sign up for, for insurance. So what this does is it basically turns it into, you ha- it makes it a gamble. You have, you say, I have, well, six months the first year, uh, three months, you know, going, starting this year and going forward, you have half the year or a quarter of the year to enroll. And if you don't, that unless you have a special situation, you know, life change or whatever, you're out of luck and you should, you know, well, you should have, you know, so if some, you're basically, you're gambling, you're, by, by taking that risk, you're saying, I am saying that there's a 75% chance that I'm not going to get sick over the next nine months or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and I'm willing to take that risk. And if you are, well, okay, then maybe you'll make it for another nine months and then you, you know, enroll next year and you've saved yourself some money. But that's the point of it. It's not... So the question, the only question I had at the time was, I knew that it was the demand because they had lines, you know, lines down the block uh, right. in, in some states, Texas and Florida. But the only question I had when they made that announcement was, are the insurance companies on board with this? Are they okay with this? You know, right. are they complaining? As f- Maybe they were, but as far as I know, they were fine with it because they saw there were these long lines of new customers yeah. and, you know, exactly. if, if, if no yeah. one had been enrolling, you know, by March 31st, if it was, if it was dead, you know, there, there was no one uh, coming in, walking off the streets. And then, you know, HHS said, well, we're going to bump it out another month. Well, then I could see an insurance company being, eh, you know, but no, they seem, they seem to be perfectly fine with it. So if they don't, they're the only ones who would be hurt by it directly. So if they're okay with it and it's, you know, not explicitly illegal or whatever, then who cares? What, you know, it's a good point. In fact, they, they were off, the insurance companies were often a kind of a bellwether, mm-hmm. uh, weren't they? They were more sanguine about uh, payment rates. Um, Absolutely. I think they had data sometimes before the states did, right? And you, you, you were picking that up. Yeah. That, well, yeah, there was some, they were, I mean, some of the, you know, some of them were being very closed, closed mouthed about it, but then some of the big ones were bragging about it. They were saying, you know, 80, 85, 90%. I mean, it ranged depending on the company and the state and so on. And they were just giving estimates. These weren't always hard numbers. But the point is that it was certainly at a bare minimum 80% for the most part. And, and they were and happy was, with it. They, you know, they, they voted yeah, yeah. with their feet in the right direction and ditto for for coming into more markets. Uh, yeah, in the abs- absolutely. And, and, you know, the other thing about that was, once again, they were saying they were getting, you know, 80, 85% uh, payment rates in the middle of you know, like early to mid April, like during the, you know, the craziness. Well, once again, something like 35, 30, 35% or something of the total, you know, enrollments through the open enrollment period didn't even start until May 1st anyway, or in some cases, right. April 1st, but like a good third were like May 1st. Well, who pay, and I kept on saying this, who pays their cable bill or their electric bill? a month or two weeks in advance. Most people, I assume, most people pay, you know, they wait until the day it's due or a couple days before it's due before they pay. Why would you expect someone, you know, most people to pay a several, potentially several hundred dollar, you know, monthly bill any sooner than it was due or, or you know, maybe a day or two, but uh, I never understood, you know, and, and even then they had grace periods and so forth. So, um, you know, so what I said at the time was it's there's nothing wrong with asking how many have paid it's a fine question to ask but not in february or march you wait until may even mid mid to late may is what i said i said if you wait until the end the last week of may and then you do a full study and survey and you find out what percentage of people had paid their their first month's premium by that point and whatever that percentage is fine lop off the rest and as it turned out it looks like it's around between you know, around 87, 88%. Um, I was going with 90% for a while, but then I, I knocked it back a little bit. So it looks like it's around 88% as far as I can tell on average. And then the next question you have is, well, what was the, it like, what's a typical attrition, you know, a triple typical non-payment rate before that? And, you know, yeah. if it's similar, if it's another 10%, you know, uh, then there's, you know, then that's standard. So. Great. Great. Well, um, move on to one more thing uh, you, you mm-hmm. mentioned uh, 
you mentioned earlier the uh, the Kaiser uh, study about the the daunting uh, lack of knowledge out there among the still uninsured that you know almost ninety percent don't know that um, open enrollment is coming. More than fifty percent don't know that the government uh, provides help to people um, to get coverage. Mm -hmm. um, now that mo that healthcare.gov and some of the state websites have opened up their shop around features, which allow you to f f to punch in a few data points: your where you are, how many people in the in the household and what the household income is, uh, if you have a grip on those basic facts. Um, on a shop around, you can get uh, a very, very quick sense of at least the least that you'll be paying. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe part of the problem was that did not, when the website was dysfunctional last year, that didn't exist. They didn't have a shop around initially. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a very bulky one for a while. Uh, I remember mm -hmm. here in New Jersey, it was, just giving the average price for a 45 year old, not even taking <laughs> right. age into account. And then by December, it was working, um, it was working adequately, but an awful lot of people didn't find it. Uh, and, and ACA navigator who worked with hundreds of people told me that almost nobody that came in who had tried to sign up themselves had found their way to the shop around. It, mm -hmm. it wasn't exactly hidden, but it wasn't emphasized. So right. now we've got a new shop around period. They've, um, They've put up the price that you can get price quotes before open season started mm -hmm. on healthcare.gov on, uh, as you know, a bunch of state exchanges mm -hmm. uh, can more about half the people who signed up last year did it without any help. Uh, so I, one might hope for me, that would be one cause of optimism that mm -hmm. uh, if you don't know about subsidies, if something motivates you to go and check it out, maybe there's a better chance you'd figure it out quickly now than you would have last year. Right. And, uh, you know, this, this, um, the, the shop around or, or window shopping or, you know, whatever, comparison shop, whatever you want to call it. That was something that, um, I had said a year ago before I even started this project back, you know, in early October when the websites were all screwed up and all that. I, I remember thinking to myself when I, the first time I was able to actually even load this, you know, the website, the healthcare.gov to get it to load. I remember wondering, you know, I posted something like over daily calls and I was like, why, why don't they have, you know, a thing where you can, cause I just, you know, I don't want to buy today. I don't want to have to plug in every you know, right. social security and all that, you know, blood type or, you know, whatever. I just wanted <laughs> to, uh, you know, check it out, you know, which I think most people just want to take a look at, see what all the fuss was about. And it was like, why didn't they do it? And, um, you know, and then finally they added it and, you know, it's, I think it's pretty obvious what the, what the reasoning was, why they didn't uh, at the time. It was basically they were scared that people were going to not understand that this is not the full, this is not the price you're paying. This is, you know, this is the full price. Here's what you're likely paying. It can't be exact because, you know, it has to be an estimate, but that they had to, that they were scared that people were going to get sticker shock because, oh my God, you know, oh, it's $800 when it, you know, it turned out that but it was they, probably but they, like the, whole, the whole point of a shop around though is you punch in your income and instead of mm -hmm. seeing 800 which again, the same same navigator told me a lot of people that's mm -hmm. all they saw right, uh, right you know if you punch in your income then you see you know 75 dollars a month or 30 dollars a month or or 130 dollars a month and hopefully you get that within 30 seconds of of uh coming to the site right and now and now that is what they're doing and you know thankfully <laughs> and i know um last week uh or earlier this week you you and i had both posted about this about the right. same issue, which we both made the same note, which was the good news is that they've opened it. And not only did they open it, they opened it early, you know, which they should have done last year. They should, they should have had it before the actual, you know, October 1st last year or November 15th this year, which they're doing mm -hmm. this year, which is good. Um, but also uh, that the final price, when you do get the final, you know, here's your options and here's the cost, um, they are showing here's your price and they're emphasizing that and that's good. But what I feel, and I think you, I think you said something about this as well, is they should definitely emphasize here is your price. But because so many people who are receiving the tax credit still don't know that they are, you should also make it clear here is the full price, here is what you are saving, here is your price. You know, to make it very obvious, right? That you know, In so fact, that, that the, way the Idaho, the Idaho exchange puts a red line through the full sticker mm -hmm. price. Right, and uh, this, so that's, that's like an Amazon kind of a thing, you know, you know, you're discounted, you know, exactly. through. 
And that's pretty standard, you know, you go to a car dealership, you know, rebate, you know, you know, here's the full, you know, retail MSRP and, you know, but you get a, you know, $1,000 rebate and, and then here's your price. And not only is that good. The government uh, really has to, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just saying it, it, it not only does it educate people, but it also, um, you know, it's also good because, you know, there's a psychological factor. People feel that they're getting like a special deal, you know, they're like, oh, just for me. You know? Not to mention your government working for you, you know, like those sort of absent signs, your, your stimulus dollars at, at mm -hmm. work. I mean, you know, it, they do now, I think, show the uh, the base price in rather small print that they, they don't say like, you know, you're. Obamacare price or your, your right, Affordable right. Care Act price or your, exactly. you know, Thanks government to this subsidized law. <laughs> Thanks to this law, you're only paying this much, you know. And right. I, I mean, I posted something a few weeks ago. Um, I remember way back, uh, remember the Bush tax cuts, right, uh, mm -hmm. back in 2001, 2003. And I remember I got a check in the mail. It was for $300 or something. And it's, yep. it was an actual physical check. And it said in the, you know, $300. And it said in the corner, tax relief for America's workers. <laughs> You know, yeah. it was right. now, now, you know, okay, that was, I mean, I, I was opposed to the tax cuts in the first place. I, and I ended up donating the whole the $300 to charity because I never asked for it. But, um, the fact is that they knew, you know, it served the purpose. The purpose, well, you know, was, there was a political purpose there, you know, it was the point was to make it clear that it's because of this administration is why you're getting that money. Well, you know, okay. You shouldn't hide the fact that, you pass this law, and part of the law is to, it's the Affordable Care Act, you know, affordable. That's the whole point, you know, or half the point. So make it clear to people, you are getting a, you know, an $800 a month policy for only, you know, 300 or 200 or whatever it is because of the uh, provisions of this law and make that right. clear. So it's not it's not that it's not that uh, the the insurance company you know likes you <laughs> you know like oh well you're special for we're going to give you a discount no it's because they're required to you know because because there are provisions in there you know yeah and even if people do know and honestly I think if you know if you read moderately carefully you'll know that you're getting a government subsidy of some kind it's um, it's not connected specifically with the. Affordable Care Act. You know, mm -hmm. The, the, the uh, political scientist Jonathan Bernstein has been saying for more than a year that uh, people very soon, especially if the law works, the, afford the ACA will disappear. Nobody will connect the benefits that they're getting specifically with this, mm -hmm. you know, huge, controversial, monstrous, uh, you know, socialist revolution law that, well, that was passed. Ask, ask, any, ask anyone in Kentucky about that, you know. <laughs> Right. You know. Oh, Connect, some, Connect is, yeah. off, is, is, is awesome, right. you know, but it's a lot better than Obamacare. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's really not funny, actually, but, you know, it is what it is. You know, people, you know, people don't make the connection. Uh, it was the same thing with, uh, you know, with the 80-20 uh, um, medical loss ratio part of the Affordable Care Act that says that, uh, for those who don't know, who are watching, uh, though, there's a rule that says that on the private insurance market, insurance companies are legally required to spend at least 80% and 85%, depending on the type of uh, policy, 80 to 85% of your premium has to go for actual health care you know, expenses. It can't go to, you know, see, you know, junkets and CEO vacations and bonuses and that sort of thing. And so, and if they, if they spend more than that, uh, or if they, if they spend less than that percentage on actual health care, they have to pay the difference. They have to rebate the difference back to the, you know, back to the customers. And there, but the thing is that there was an article that was, I was reading about this that was saying, well, you know, like a billion dollars or $2 billion has already been given back by the insurance companies, which is great. The problem is that, um, and a lot, it's not a big check that says, you know, relief for America's workers. It's, you don't get a check in the mail. You might get like a line item on your, you know, tax return or that, that's some obscure reference or something. Or you might get, uh, if it's an employer-sponsored insurance, your employer might get it. And, you know, maybe you'll never know about it. You know, maybe, maybe they just, I don't know if they're required to disclose it. I don't think so. But it's it's hidden. It's buried. It's, it's not, and like you said, there's a disconnect. There's no obvious connection between this law saved me this money or, you know, made this policy that much less expensive because of this law, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's, that I think they need to work on. Yeah. Well, I had originally thought maybe we'd get into some of the nuts and bolts of uh, the 
strengths and weaknesses of uh, of the shop arounds, uh, mm -hmm. but I think uh, it, we've done the better part of an hour, and um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know if anyone would hear it if we did it, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, well, all, all I'll say about that, I mean, I did before we before we spoke. I did briefly, just very quickly. I just went through you know the various exchange, state exchange websites, and uh, uh, you know some are better than others. Uh, I'll just say real quickly, um, you know, some have some really cool features. You had mentioned Idaho, um, mm -hmm. you know, which is the which is unique because it's the only one moving off of healthcare.gov onto its own exchange, and it actually yeah, it looks like they've learned a lot of lessons from watching you know, all the others uh, over the past year. Um, they have yeah. some pretty cool features. Um, I did notice one thing on Idaho, by the way. I mm -hmm. noticed that it for each when you enter people's ages, it refers to them as uh, you know, as spouse. You, you have a choice of spouse or child, right? But it, it, it doesn't say you know second per, second adult in household. It says spouse. <laughs> that was interesting. Yeah, that is that is odd because it could. And like, is that an Idaho thing? You, could, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know. <laughs> well, if it were Utah, I might think it was a Mormon thing. <laughs> well. But, uh, yeah, I thought that was yeah, interesting. Who knows? Um, but yeah, now there's one. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say it was super quick. And you know, so, so yeah, some look at like they're actually very slick. They've added some new features. I know Connect in Kentucky. They've uh, they've added a mobile app. Uh, Connecticut has an app as well, a mobile app, which is cool. Um, others, you know, seem okay. Um, I know some I'm a little concerned about. Uh, Vermont, in particular, is probably the most concerning at the mo moment because it's still offline. Um, but in, you know, Hawaii, I'm not sure what's going on with Hawaii's. But, but yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, it's a range. But overall, they all seem to be to have made significant improvements, um, you know, to, and, and new features and I know that they've added more customer service reps and phone lines and that sort of thing. So yeah, I think that should yeah. all be good. I hope. I would just add a note about um, a new feature in high Idaho and there's a version of it uh, in California. Um, you, it might be sort of the, the next, next generation, although it's not exactly brain surgery. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, they ask you, how many times you you're likely to go to the doctor or how many times you went to the doctor in the last year, how mm -hmm. many, uh, how many, uh, drug prescriptions you have. And then when you go to the results, you can sort on a tab that, that, um, asks what you're like, that sorts the plans by your likely costs. And it will actually, mm -hmm. based on how heavy your medical usage is, it'll effectively make rec recommendations. If you don't use right. much, it'd be lower premium, higher deductible. If you use a lot, it would be higher premium, lower deductible. Yeah, so that's that cool. is a yeah, it works, that's a bit right. of decision support. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, it, it, I found it a little hard to find on the Idaho site because when you go to the results, it's still like most of them just starts with the cheapest premium plans, bronze, mm -hmm. which I, you know I think is arguably a mistake. You have to go to the top to the sort button and, and find the tab that will um, sort according to your likely costs. But right. it's a step. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody pointed out to me, uh, Tom Baker at the University of Pennsylvania, that some of this decision support stuff, it's not the wheel doesn't have to be reinvented. You can go on Medicare.gov. Mm -hmm. And for Medicare Part D, it'll ask you exactly what your uh, what your drug prescriptions are. And then mm -hmm. it will recommend the plans that are likeliest to cost you least. Right. Uh, and I think there are other decision support tools up there. So uh, you know, it's 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 getting up to uh, getting up to speed more than uh, being absolutely cutting edge. But those things are uh, those features are on the horizon, and right. some decision support. Um, yeah, and that's you know, and that's where I'll, I'll I'll be honest with all the discussion and fuss, and this this literally just occurred to me as you were saying. <laughs> With all this fuss and bother and discussion about, you know, with the Supreme Court case and all, oh, you know, the state exchange versus the federal exchange, I will say there, there is one uh, possible advantage from a technical innovation point of view that having, you know, uh, 15 or more, hopefully, you know, uh, um, state exchange, you know, different websites, um, as opposed to everybody being on a single, you know, single healthcare.gov. I mean, healthcare.gov has made a lot of imp uh, tremendous improvements, as we both, you know, discussed over last year, based on experience. But also having, you know, 12, 15 plus uh, state sites, it shows you this stuff. You know, you, they can experiment, and you know, this works, this doesn't. We found this feature is cool. You know, this feature is really cool, but nobody's using it. And this one, right. you know, this one 
this one would be nice, but it costs too much, or, or you know, but this one, oh, we didn't think that people would like, but they love it, and so yeah, there's, there's a lot of you know, a lot of innovation, yeah. a lot of uh, a state laboratory doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, so, yeah so that's an, that's that's one that's one argument in favor of uh, you know of, of the state exchanges. Uh, right, and uh, you know that was part of the <laughs> that was part of the quote unquote conservative ideology. Is that mm-hmm. you know states should do it their own way and they should learn from each well, other and they rights. should be laboratories and right. yeah states rights and also you know just sort of lionizing state government is better than federal government but also uh, you know there, there's certainly a degree of truth that you know having all that range of of experimentation uh, can be helpful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I agree. So. Is that um... so? Maybe uh, maybe we've about uh, covered the waterfront there, and uh, I, I think so. Yeah, I think the only thing we didn't get into was the Medicaid side, but it, yeah, I agree. We're, we're, we're I think we're over an hour here, so <laughs> or, yeah, just just about there. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, we will uh, cross fingers and um, you know hope that this open season kicks off smoothly and. That your numbers are uh, are on target, but low on target. And, yeah, I would, uh, like I said, I would love to be low. I would love to be, you know, oh, it's fifteen million, it's twenty million, it's it's, it's the whole country. <laughs> it's all yeah. three hundred million of us, <laughs> you know. But I, I yeah, don't see that. Empl- employers drop coverage on mass, and uh, well, and <laughs> you know, you know, okay, that I wouldn't like, but you know what I mean. Is uh, yeah, I would be more than happy to be low on the on the low, uh, wrong on the low side. Um, you know, but but yeah, we'll see. We'll see what plays out. Should be should be interesting. All right. Well, I've got a dog here who wants to be fed who just jumped on my <laughs> lap. For the benefit of our massive audience, I'm going to raise him to the camera and say goodbye. Okay. And uh, it's been great talking to you. Likewise, I appreciate it, and uh, look forward uh, to seeing you online you know, going forward. Yeah, me too. Take care. You too.